uh, I think I'll start uh, my comments by uh, I'll upload uh, the uh, presentation and we will start by discussing the um, the corona the coronavirus and its uh, uh, and its implications. Uh, obviously, it's something that is affecting um, uh, the U.S. and globally. In Israel, it's it's pretty much the only topic of conversation. We will connect it to the public and political process. Uh, at this point in time, there's uh, uh, over 300 and uh, uh, over 300 uh, uh, identified infected uh, Israeli citizens. Um, uh, some of them, a small portion, have been. Uh, uh, hospitalized, uh, but the measures are becoming uh, uh, stricter uh, by the day. Workplaces are still able to uh, function with a restriction of up to 30% of the employees, and an essential um, uh, curfew or isolation has been imposed with, uh, 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 with uh, uh, restrictions such as uh, schools are closed, kindergartens, gyms, uh, uh, commerce, except for essentials. So something uh, dramatic is taking place with uh, uh, vast implications of the economy. Uh, just over the past uh, 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 week or so, at least 100,000 Israelis have, uh, 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 have reported to uh, have lost their jobs or have been uh, gone on a uh, vacation that is uh, a coerced vacation and we expect uh, additional hundreds of thousands. So something very significant is, uh, is taking place and, it, and obviously has vast implications first and foremost on, on the health of Israelis and potential health and the economy, but obviously it also has uh, uh, political implications and implications on our uh, democracy. So. With respect to the economy, uh, the government now is, we have an interim government with a budget that has been approved in late 2017. Yes, late 2017, because it was a biannual budget. And now we're operating based on a one uh, divided by 12 uh, uh, for each month of that budget that has been approved then. So it, 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 to some extent, it limits the government's ability uh, to come up with a, a fiscal stimulus package. Uh, the government did come up with a, a variety of economic measures, uh, a, a, but a, a, a significant, dramatic budget that will expand, uh, that will provide a, a, a contravening uh, vector and expand the economy. This, is, uh, this requires a, a functioning government that can also uh, legislate, and this is not the case. So you really need a government in order to deal uh, properly deal uh, with this crisis. And for the time being, it's being managed by the interim government and the professional uh, uh, civil uh, uh, servants and, and health uh, professionals. So wh what are the political implications of that? Obviously, Israelis uh, uh, supported the uh, a unity government even before the crisis. And we have some numbers that demonstrate it. That's the most popular government that Israelis want. They have a far greater support than for a narrow uh, center-left government or for a narrow right-wing plus ultra-Orthodox government. There are significant numbers of support of Israelis that want expect uh, a national unity. Now, with the corona, um, uh, there is even greater support for uh, a national unity. And whoever will be perceived as uh, not uh, uh, promoting that cause uh, uh, would probably uh, pay a, a public uh, uh, price for that. Uh, an additional uh, 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 political implication is that uh, a fourth election becomes even less uh, legitimate and less likely. So Israelis want a unity government and they want a government. And uh, so that puts pressure on, on politicians to make compromises and for the first time, the blue and white uh, uh, men, uh, publicly uttered that uh, they would be willing to enter a unity government, even if Netanyahu would be first in a rotation. Uh, but now Mr. Netanyahu, that feels that he has a stronger hand, um, uh, basically offers a, 
rotation in two years or something, something that everybody realizes that is never going to happen. So currently, the discussion is, is uh, on unity is, is not about who's going to go first, but rather for how long. Netanyahu probably will be first if there's a unity government. The question is for how long. And uh, uh, Netanyahu uh, is uh, at the same time managing uh, uh, the crisis pretty much single-handedly alongside with uh, uh, professional civil servants, but politically there's no real legislator and uh, uh, that, that, that is uh, functioning and approving government decisions and passing legislation and so on. Uh, and, uh, and it's an interim government where the prime minister has a, 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 an unprecedented amount of authority. So and the prime minister is, is obviously uh, um, uh, uh, gaining a lot of uh, uh, public traction with uh, um, almost everyday uh, press conferences and uh, uh, briefing and instructing the public and so on. Uh, and, and that approves his... Uh, ratings for premiership, at least so far, it's, it's, uh, he's perceived by the Israeli public as properly handling the, price, the crisis, and that increases, obviously, his, uh, 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 I wouldn't say increases his appetite for a fourth election, but uh, there are those who say that that's uh, something that he uh, uh, is, that, that's the preferred option for him because he thinks that finally he will achieve the uh, uh, majority that he seeks. From a democratic perspective, the government is, is uh, using uh, some means that, in, you know, until very recently, a few days ago, were considered unprecedented in terms of using a, a phone uh, 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 data on location of Israelis in order to identify who might have been affected and whether Israelis are actually, Israeli citizens are uh, self-isolating or self-quarantining themselves as necessary, and um, uh, there is some uh, quite there are some question marks because while you know we are in a difficult situation in a crisis, and uh, it's legitimate to use digital tools and other tools, um, there's uh, because the Knesset has still not been you know fully assembled with committees. There's no proper oversight, proper discussion, and so on. So hopefully those things will be uh, uh, rectified over the next few days, uh, and, uh, and there are uh, some far-reaching democratic implications to the way this crisis is being handled. So those were a few initial corona um, um, uh, remarks, corona and the economy, corona and health, corona and politics, corona and democracy. And, uh, and, and this is where the mindset of, of Israelis are extremely worried about their, you know, about tomorrow, about making a living, about their health, about the health of their loved ones. This is where the minds of Israelis are right now. Now I, I, I am going back to the March uh, election uh, result. That's the, again, the result. And I put it on a table comparing the uh, results of April round one, round two, and in round three, and the question is, uh, if we uh, compare those three uh, rounds, what uh, what essentially has changed? And we're seeing that uh, uh, the, the the situation, while some changes in the margins took place, the the political landscape in Israel is pretty stable uh, over the past year. So we're seeing blue and white, 35, 33, 33, Likud, 35, 32, 36. Um, um, the, um, uh, the, obviously, the uh, ultra-Orthodox parties are pretty uh, uh, stable. Uh, uh, quite a significant change with a joint uh, list that represents uh, 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 the Arab population. Quite a dramatic rise from 10 to 13 to 15. Uh, and otherwise, uh, we will touch upon some of the changes, but that's, that's the, uh, the broad look. If we want to see it in a broader perspective, that's, uh, I think, quite an interesting uh, way to look at it. Uh, this slide demonstrates the changes in Israel's 
basically four, the sizes of the four political blocks since the 2009 election. So we're looking here at six election campaigns. And, and, and what we can see is that when you look at the top, uh, the ultra orthodox blocks, 16 and 09, 16 right now, there's some explanations. The, the makeup today of the 16 is, is more um, a homogenous uh, ultra orthodox uh, supporters as opposed to in 09, where it also included a, a greater share of uh, traditional Sephardi uh, voters that identify with Shas party, but essentially 16 uh, seats of the ultra orthodox. If you look at the uh, right wing block, which included in 09, uh, Lieberman, Likud, and the various versions of the National Religious uh, uh, Party or parties. So it was 49 in 09. And essentially, if you, uh, it's 42 now, but it's 42 just because Lieberman moved out, uh, moved himself out of the right wing, the natural home of the right wing bloc. So essentially, if you re include Lieberman, you see that it was 49 in 09, a 49 in 2015 and 49, uh, 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 49 in, uh, in April of 19 and 49 right now. So basically nothing changed, neither with the ultra-Orthodox bloc or with the right-wing bloc. The, there's the underlying trends of Israeli politics are very stable beyond the, you know, when we look at campaigns and issues and so on, the uh, Israelis are situating themselves in the, in the, in the different, uh, 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 I would say, parts of, uh, of the political spectrum, there's something uh, that is very much connected to identity, uh, a sense of belonging, level of religiosity. There are some deep uh, uh, issues that have to do with identity and less with politics that define where Israelis are. And in, in, in this respect, it explains the uh, remarkable stability. Uh, when we look at, in the bottom of this uh, uh, chart on the Arab votes in the green, we see that the, the increase pretty much reflects questions of turnout between 11 and 09 and, and 15 in uh, in uh, in 2020. It's a it's a it's a reflection of mainly of turnout. Uh, and uh, the center left, we're seeing that the traditionally is it, is anywhere between. Uh, 40 and 45. Traditionally, 45 was the magic number, and now it uh, it, uh, it declined. It somewhat declined, uh, also because of the rise in, in, in levels of participation. Uh, when uh, Mr. Lieberman, uh, 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 some votes went to Mr. Lieberman, although a tiny margin, uh, rates of participation uh, affected it. Um, uh, but Mr. Netanyahu's uh, campaign was effective and, and, and also managed to uh, uh, shift a few votes. So essentially, when we look at Israeli politics, the, 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 what, what makes the difference is, this, is, a, is a relatively small uh, change in the margins, and it's, it's less dramatic. And to some extent, it also it, it, it would echo what we know of the American politics, uh, where the, the, the movement between the different... Uh, Camps is 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 only is only in the margins and, and not much more than that. Um, when we look at turnout, so again uh, we had uh, uh, an increase in turnout in uh, in, in this uh, uh, in this uh, election um, between April, uh, September, and uh, and uh, and this March. Uh, we ended up with 71%. It's 1% less than what we had in 2015. But generally, it's uh, aside from 2015, it's the highest since 1999. Uh, so Israel did not experience what we call in other democracies an election fatigue, uh, where people, when there's a consecutive cycle of election campaigns, people decide to stay at home. This wasn't uh, uh, the case uh, in Israel. Israelis showed up. The major difference was uh, in terms of, uh, and we see it in the, in the, in the bottom uh, part of the chart, uh, the red line is participation of the Arab minority went up from 49 to 59 to almost 65%. It's even greater than 2015. 
Um, it has many factors. Maybe with the, uh, later as we move into the discussion, we can uh, touch upon it. Um, some of it uh, has to do with the change of uh, sense of worth of, uh, of participation in politics. The fact that for the first time, there was a sense among the Arab population that their vote counts, that they can actually uh, have an impact on who's going to be prime minister. Uh, and, and essentially we saw now the fact that the, the joint Arab list uh, made, uh, recommended Mr. Gantz to uh, receive the mandate. And as a result of that, he received the mandate and not Mr. Netanyahu. This is new. It only happened once before in September. And before that, the lobbying was the only, you know, lobbying in the beginning of the 90s uh, was the only time that uh, uh, one of the candidates to form a government actually met the Arab parties for a coalition negotiation. So Gantz met with them in September and he received the partial recommendation to form the government. And now he received the recommendation from all 15. And uh, the reason why they recommended him was not only uh, in order to affect uh, uh, to increase Gantz's likelihood of forming a government, but it's also to demonstrate to their own population that they matter, that they're relevant, that their vote counts. And we know that 80% of Arab citizens uh, want their politicians to try and join a, a coalition government. This is something that we, um, uh, did not characterize our politics in the past. In the past, joining a government, a Zionist government, was perceived as illegitimate by the uh, uh, majority of the uh, 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 those who are part of the Arab population, and that has changed. So things are changing, although there is still not an acceptance among uh, uh, those who are uh, a majority of, of Jews uh, that are uh, willing to contend with this idea, and there are all sorts of uh, complexities that may explain that. But uh, the bottom line is that uh, there is still not sufficient legitimacy in the eyes of, Jew, of the Jewish majority to normalize the participation of, uh, of uh, uh, the Arab minority uh, in our uh, in politics. Um, this um, uh, demonstrates uh, the results in, in some, in, in Tel Aviv, we see the turnout was uh, high, but you know, not, not as high as, you know, less than the national average. There are all sorts of explanations for that. We see that Tel Aviv is a, is a strong stronghold of, of blue and white. That again, might, you might find similarities to it in American politics, the metro, great metropolitan areas such as uh, New York, LA, along the seashores as opposed to the uh, mainland uh, US. So some of this equivalent of greater Tel Aviv more supporting blue and white versus uh, 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 the other towns such as Netanya, Ashdod, Ashkelon, uh, uh, that are uh, 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 that uh, are more inclined to support uh, the Likud. And we see that the, the increase in the support for blue and white was at the expense of and labor, Geshen, and Meretz, uh, and, and not because they got more votes than they could. That uh, blue and white uh, also has a vast majority among kibbutzim. And labor, the labor movement, Meretz, that has Mapam in it, the two movements that, that created the kibbutzim movement are not uh, received a tiny fraction in the kibbutzim, 28% versus 58% for blue and white. It was perceived as the leader of the center-left uh, uh, camp, and it's it's legitimate candidate to form a government, and uh, and those are the sort of uh, blue and white strongholds, uh, and their support for blue and white towns like Ibatayim or the Sharon, for Saba, Ranana, all around 50 percent or even above 50 percent uh, 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 support for blue and white, and and turnout figures in those uh, towns. They generally belong to the sort of middle class and upper middle class of Israeli society. Turnout was, uh, uh, by and large, more than the national average. Say in a place like Hoda Sharon, it was about 76%. Um, that's the ultra, uh, some data that demonstrates the ultra-Orthodox turnout. Obviously, the highest turnout in the country 
is the ultra-Orthodox population in the mid 80s, 83 or 84 percent. It's always very consistent, very high. Uh, that explains why the ultra-Orthodox have 16 seats, although they represent only 12 percent of the population, while the Arab minority is closer to 20 percent of the population, and they have 15 seats. It's also about turnout and also uh, uh, has other explanations, but, but turnout is a big one. And the ultra-Orthodox obviously uh, are uh, a minority that a minority group that uh, uh, is overly represented in, in, in our politics with 16 seats for their parties, and they, and they, they are very uh, uh, competent at turning those 16 seats into uh, extensive political power uh, because they become the marginal voices that uh, uh, votes that the government depends on. This is especially true as long as uh, the Arab uh, votes are considered quote unquote Ill illegitimate partners for a coalition, then it becomes almost essentially impossible to achieve a 61 majority without an alliance with the ultra-Orthodox. So essentially for blue and white, if the Arab uh, the joint list is not a legitimate quote unquote option for uh, um, a government, and as long as the ultra-Orthodox have recently, the, over the past few years, situated themselves deep in the camp, in the right-wing camp, and no longer uh, available quote unquote for the highest bidder, that basically means that the best blue and white can hope for is a national unity government with the Likud, uh, again, unless they uh, break the taboo of uh, bringing in uh, the Arab uh, votes, so that you know that's uh, that explains why it's such an important political project for the Israeli right wing to delegitimize uh, the participation of the Arab parties. Uh, obviously, it uh, it, uh, it uh, allow it, it, it provides them with a massive advantage in, in forming. A, a coalition government. Uh, here in the settlements, we see that there was a decline in support for Otsma Yehudit, the Ben Gvir, the Kahana uh, associated party, and, 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 and that explains a lot of the rise of the Likud, about 60,000 votes that moved from uh, Otsma Yehudit uh, to the Likud, plus votes that moved from Lieberman to the Likud, and a relatively small portion from the uh, Blue and white and labor, perhaps together, one uh, 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 almost one seat. So that 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 explains the main changes that took place in in um, in the uh, March election versus September is Otsma uh, Yehudit, the extreme right wing party, and going down from eighty thousand votes to about twenty thousand, and most of that going back to either Yemen or Likud. Uh, Likud uh, gaining those votes, plus a significant amount of votes, around two seats uh, from Lieberman, around one seat from uh, uh, Blue and White, a slight decline in, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in turnout of Blue and White voters that uh, didn't come out in places like Rishon Lezion. So that, that explains the, uh, the shift of a movement of about, or the increase of about five seats in, in, in favor of the uh, Likud plus ultra-Orthodox uh, bloc, and that was offset by the ter increased turnout of the Arab uh, population, and that's why the overall the uh, right-wing uh, plus ultra-Orthodox bloc grew from 55 to 58. So the, the, that's the change that happened. It's a change in the margin, but a change obviously that makes a difference. And again, the Likud strongholds, we see uh, you know, places like Afula, Kiryat Atta, Ashkelon, Be'er Sheva. So it's around the center and in the, in the periphery, we see those uh, massive Likud strongholds. And, and we see that basically the Likud was able to uh, uh, recover and achieve the April outcome um, uh, after there was a September decline. The September decline uh, it, it, is, it, it may be explained mainly by the fact that the, the, what Blue and White and Lieberman offered in September was national unity without the ultra-Orthodox. Two uh, uh, very popular 
statements among mainstream Israelis, both that define themselves as center, center right, soft right wing voters. Uh, once those ideas were off the table, it was clear in the March election that unity is not on the table. It's either uh, a right wing plus ultra orthodox government, narrow government led by guns and supported by uh, the joint list, or a fourth election. Once that became the choice, uh, then regardless of the Netanyahu indictment and the fact that he's an, a defendant, many voters that didn't, that although they didn't feel comfortable with the Netanyahu's legal situation, decided to, uh, you know, soft right wing voters and center right voters decided to nevertheless uh, uh, support uh, Netanyahu. The fact that he had better uh, uh, figures for fit for premiership also uh, supported that. And now, and we see it in the figures in places like. Netanyahu, where Likud went up from 36 to 43 uh, percent. So it's basically, it, it includes uh, Israelis who are uncomfortable with Netanyahu's legal situation, but uh, uh, when they uh, took into account all the other uh, consideration and the option of a Gantz minority-led government, they still uh, uh, preferred uh, Netanyahu and, it, and they wanted the deadlock uh, uh, over. Um, uh, this uh, demonstrates not only the uh, turnout in the Arab population, but also support, share of support for the joint list that went up. Mainly uh, the fact that new voters, what, what explains the increase, almost 90% support among Arabs for the joint list. What explains that is not only the decline in support for labor and Geshel, and uh, labor and merits from 10 to 2%, but also that the new voters that joined in mainly voted for the uh, joint list. Uh, 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 a significant portion of the 7% that did vote for uh, the blue and white and, and uh, labor merits are Druze voters. So uh, non-Druze uh, uh, voters uh, that voted for Zionist parties are, uh, are few and far between. Now, um, um, some of the issues that are uh, uh, on the table. So we've, I think we, we've uh, discussed it in the past, but um, uh, both in terms of the corona uh, uh, measures that are now corona related measures and, and restrictions that are being uh, considered and uh, with respect to the uh, measures that the, the prime minister was trying to introduce or uh, legislation to provide for immunity, reduce the court, uh, a French law that means that you can uh, to cancel legal proceedings against the prime minister, to reduce the, 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 the court's ability to intervene in that. Um, I, uh, the point of this slide is to demonstrate the, the uh, amount of checks and balances. So we're seeing here the uh, American uh, constitution. Well, Israel does not have a constitution. We have basic laws that are amount together to a constitution, but the basic laws are not protected in any manner. Any Knesset with a simple majority can uh, cancel basic laws, legislate new basic laws. So we, we do not have, we're the only democracy except for the unique UK case without a constitution, without the constitutional checks and balances that ensure separation of powers and so on. We also do not have uh, the, the uh, local governments like state and, and, and strong uh, uh, local municipalities, the municipalities are completely controlled uh, by the central uh, government and, 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 and do not have their own uh, autonomy. Uh, the, the Knesset, uh, unlike the US Senate and House of Representatives, the Knesset is fully controlled by a coalition majority, so it does not serve as a, as a, as a, as a strong check and balance to the government. So what we uh, uh, what uh, the only mechanism that checks the otherwise all powerful political majority or, or coalition majority, and in this case, a, a political, uh, an interim government without a, a majority, is uh, but the only other independent uh, institution is our independent judiciary, uh, that by the way uh, uh, makes its uh, judgments and verdicts and decisions based on basic laws that the Knesset defines. So based on, quote, unquote, the constitution that the Knesset legislates. So what we have is an independent judiciary 
uh, that can uh, uh, provide some check to either it's uh, you know corona related measures whether they're uh, 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 too radically infringing on basic uh, freedoms or uh, when it comes to a case of a prime minister on, uh, under an indictment that wants to change the legislation in a situation of conflict of interest uh, uh, and to uh, appoint a state prosecutor and, uh, uh, and and so on. I mean, the scenarios that have been surfaced uh, were very, uh, should Netanyahu uh, with his partners have received 61 majority were very, some of the scenarios were very uh, concerning and, and worrying in terms of their impact on, on the separation of powers. And essentially they meant uh, affecting and overriding the independence of the judiciary. So that, that, is, that is just to emphasize the, the, the importance of that. Um, in terms of the, the timeline for the political process, again, it's the same process that took place in April and September. The president assigns a mandate. He assigned the mandate to Mr. Gantz because 61 MKs, members of Knesset, recommended Mr. Gantz. And, um, and uh, Gantz has a 28-day period to try and form a government. He might get an additional 14 days. Uh, uh, if he's not successful, uh, the president then can assign another MK, uh, perhaps Mr. Netanyahu, with, a, a, with an option of forming a government. And if not, there's an option of, uh, of uh, a 61 MKs submitting a written request to the president. So. So that's the process, and if, if in none of those milestones and there's an, a successful attempt to form a government, the country automatically goes into a fourth election campaign. And that sounds like a completely uh, 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 unreasonable scenario, but the law dictates that process, and if there's no successful success in forming a government, uh, we might end up in a fourth election. There's even a logistical question in a time of corona how can such an election take place? Um, uh, what a, 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 given that process, what are the uh, options for forming a government? There, mathematically, there are three options. As I mentioned before, the most likely is a unity government, um, uh, at least led initially by Mr. Netanyahu, with some kind of agreement of a rotation. Uh, that will or will not actually uh, be uh, uh, implemented. Um, such a unity government has uh, uh, obviously the initial, uh, its initial and most important task would be to deal with the uh, health, economic, uh, and economic implications of the uh, corona crisis and to stabilize the economy, to stabilize uh, the situation uh, here. All else uh, becomes uh, marginal at this point. Obviously, such a government uh, with a, a broad majority would also have the option of, uh, if, if there is goodwill among the politicians, to legislate electoral reform with a broad agreement and, and constitutional measures that will uh, ensure that the principle of separation of powers in Israel is, 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 is adhered to. And, and to ensure that our democracy will be less fragile, as we just discussed before, it's, it's extremely fragile. But so, so those are some of the options. Unity government can come in all sorts of forms. Basically, blue and white and Likud are enough for that. But there's, you know, given the prime minister's the importance that he associates with the, for the alliance with the ultra orthodox, I can't see any real option of unity without the entire block of 58 of. Uh, uh, ultra orthodox plus right wing parties, uh, and assuming the prime minister does not uh, uh, provide a, a reasonable uh, deal, it might be national unity uh, 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 without even a, a rotation. Assuming they would want to dodge a, a third, a fourth election, and perhaps it will be determined as an interim government or something of that sort. The, the center-left minority government, i.e. a government supported by 61 MKs uh, with blue and white labor merits and outside support from Lieberman in the joint list is a, a low likelihood. There are two members of, of blue and white that uh, said that they will oppose it. And um, so even as a threat for Mr. Gantz to get a better unity deal, it's, uh, 
it's not, uh, it doesn't seem likely, but perhaps if it, it will seem that Netanyahu does not offer any reasonable option for unity, that might be revived. Another a variation of a center-left minority government might also be a government by technocrats. It will be supported by those 61 as an interim measure to allow us to deal with the corona crisis and, and get out of the deadlock. So that's an option that actually here at IDI, we, we, we created a blueprint for how it might look like, but so far I'm not sure there's traction for it at this point in the political system. And finally, there's an option of a right-wing, uh, plus ultra-Orthodox, plus a few defectors uh, 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 that will allow the Prime Minister to form a government, or perhaps even a minority government with blue and white, or Lieberman saying, we will abstain or support for the outside, just because we weren't able to agree with you on a government, on a unity government, we weren't able to form one ourselves, and we do not want the country to go into a, another election. So I'm, I'm not ruling out an option of a minority government led by Mr. Netanyahu. Politically, it would also seem like a more favorable option for blue and white, ironically, because uh, their flirtation uh, with the um, uh, joint list uh, um, did not... Uh, add to their popularity and Netanyahu's uh, conduct vis-a-vis -vis the corona crisis adds to his popularity. So I think both them and Lieberman would be fe fearful politically from a fourth election campaign beyond uh, obviously the, the substantive arguments against a fourth election campaign. So I wouldn't rule out that option as well. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure it sounds a little uh, complicated uh, um, but uh, those are the options going forward. So I'll leave uh, uh, that slide on, and Tamar, uh, uh, we can uh, engage in, in uh, conversation as soon as some questions came up. Great. But Thank you so much. You have Thank you so much. And I want to encourage everybody, I know there was a lot of information there that was shared. I want to encourage you to use the Q&A box on the bottom of your screen. In the next few moments, you can write in some different questions. Um, and I will get us started with a few that have, that have come in. So one that you, you touched on a bit, but why is it such a big deal for Arab parties to join a coalition? Aren't they full citizens? Haven't they before? So thank you. Well, it's a, it, it's a, it's a great question um, about, about the Arab minority and its legitimacy for joining a, a government. Uh, on the one hand, it sounds pretty trivial. You know, twenty percent of the population voting. They have members of Knesset, but historically, the Arabs never wanted to join the government. They still don't want to join the government now. Now they actually want to sort of support the coalition and in return uh, uh, serve their population's interests. Historically, they had no interest because of a government that has. Uh, that conducts a security policy vis-a-vis -vis Gaza, vis-a-vis -vis Gaza, West Bank. Uh, and, 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 and we have to remember that our 20% of Arab citizens, a portion of their identity is Palestinian. They are, the majority of them are Arab, are Muslim. They define themselves as Arab, Muslim, Israeli, Palestinian. Those are the sort of identities that make up their identity. And as long as there's an active conflict with the Palestinians, it was very difficult for them to join any government that is uh, uh, instructing the IDF uh, in, in its conflict with, uh, with the Palestinians. So that, that, that explains the historical uh, uh, rejection of the idea of joining any government, and it wasn't really on the table. Increasingly, we're seeing an interesting, and in my eyes, uh, a positive trend of a growing interest of the Arab population and growing expectation from their politicians to join governments and, uh, and, and to be part of the decision making and they want a, a more equitable allocation of resources. So that's, uh, and, 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 and that explains why Ahmed Tibi and Ayman Oden, the leaders of the uh, uh, joint list, are, uh, are becoming more pragmatic. This is something that they understand that their public expects. Now, what's happening on the Jewish side? On the Jewish side, there isn't, uh, a, a, on the one hand, there's interesting data that shows, and, and, and we have very interesting uh, sort of surveys and publications on that. There is data that shows that 
Israelis are, are very comfortable with uh, having an Arab uh, doctor uh, treat them or uh, having a or having the government equally allocate resources and funds to Jews and Arabs, to Jewish to uh, towns that are mainly populated by Jews and Arabs and so on. So, so there's no issue with civic equality. But when it comes to uh, 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 sharing decision-making uh, uh, capital, if you will, sharing, uh, bringing a uh, Arab uh, representatives to take part in government decision making, a government that might have to decide on questions of a conflict vis-a-vis -vis Gaza with the Palestinians, conflict vis-a-vis -vis whether it's Hamas or Islam and Jihad. Uh, a majority of Israelis, somewhere in the 60s, uh, you know, about two-thirds of Israelis, are very uncomfortable uh, uh, with that because they're saying a government that will depend on the support of, a, of a, a, a politicians a, that represent the population that partially identifies itself as Palestinian, we need then to a, make security policy vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians. As long as the conflict is ongoing, they find it very difficult to contend with. I, I must say, although personally, I think that it's a, it, it, it's a very important progress that we're making to integrate the Arab minority into our politics, into the political process. It's an important progress. It, it should be supported. At the same time, we have to have some empathy and understanding to the difficulties because there are real difficulties. I served in the Defense and Foreign Affairs Committee for six years. Our government is taking real decisions vis-a-vis -vis Gaza and so on. And when a government depends uh, on, 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 on uh, its survival, depends on, on the support of, of the joint list, and it has to make difficult security decisions, there are real difficulties here. So it's not like two thirds of Israelis are off the deep end. There is a real difficulty, and we will have to contend with it and to learn how to deal with it and how to resolve it. But I think we ought to have some sort of uh, uh, level of empathy to the difficulty and there's a role for leaders on both sides to help us move forward until the uh, Arab politicians are fully integrated into our political process. Great. Thank you very much. We have another question that came in. That's, what do you think about labor and merits do next? Uh, do you think their historical role has ended? Well, when we look at, as long as our electoral system is is the existing one, which is uh, uh, proportional representation with uh, 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 that, uh, that led to the makeup of about eight parties in our Knesset just about a decade ago or a decade and a half ago, we had about 15 parties. We're down to eight as a result of all sorts of processes and um, including the relatively high threshold of 3.25%. Um, the result of that is that the makeup of the center left in Israel is that we have a strong, relatively dominant centrist party, blue and white, that has a, a center right uh, 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 side and a center left, but a, a centrist party that is um, uh, a, a potential ruling party and, and has a potential appeal also to soft right wing uh, voters. And, and, and then there's a Zionist uh, left-wing uh, party uh, that is a combination now of labor and merits. Now, labor and merits have different traditions, different pasts, and so on. But when you look at the amount of Israelis that self-identify themselves as, Zion, as, as left-wing Zionists, it's around, depending on how you ask the question, anywhere between 12 and 14 to 15 percent. That's the amount of Israelis that define themselves as left-wing. The others are uh, about... 25 to 30 percent define themselves as center, and then there's you know soft right and right wing and so on. So, so I don't think politically there's enough market share for the Zionist left if, for two separate parties. I think there it, it's a natural process for them to uh, to join together and define themselves as a Zionist left wing party, and perhaps there's room for a. Uh, 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 a Jewish Arab partnership in the Israeli left that will sort of break up the joint list into a, 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 a one party that is 
uh, uh, has the support only of the Arab population in one uh, joint uh, Jewish Arab outfit. So perhaps there's room for that. But that's the, the current architecture of Israeli politics, I think, does not leave room for a separate labor and a separate net in the previous format. Interesting. Thank you. We have another question that just came in that says, discuss efforts to pass a law that would make the prime minister ineligible to serve. Well, um, and those are efforts uh, initiated by both Blue and White and Lieberman, uh, uh, a legislative effort. You know, they have 61 majority in the Knesset, not so much to form a government because the, the just not BB camp is not a cohesive camp. It only agrees on one thing, that they do not want Netanyahu to continue to be prime minister. And that's why they recommended Mr. Gantz, but there's no positive majority there to actually uh, 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 build a cohesive government. So they are able to put forward a, a legislation uh, that there's a few versions. One version is that the prime minister uh, cannot uh, uh, serve under an indictment and cannot even obtain the mandate to form a government, because Netanyahu still didn't get the mandate. Gantz got it. Assuming Gantz fails, but they do pass a legislation in the Knesset, right now that Netanyahu can't get it, uh, because as, a, as a, uh, a prime minister that is under an indictment, he cannot uh, either gain the mandate or serve as prime minister. That, that's, the, uh, that, that's the sort of uh, version of that legislation. The, there are two issues. One, a constitutional, um, a retroactive legislation that uh, sort of determines now on, uh, on what should be the, the, the outcome of the election or is, 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 pro is problematic. It makes more sense to legislate now for what will happen in, in a fourth election or in a future election. That's one of the, uh, I think, options Blue and White is considering. And that is also in order to create a threat for Mr. Netanyahu, that if he pushes for fourth election, that legislation will kick in and will be constitutionally valid. Um, uh, politically, it has, doesn't have too many implications right now, because if Mr. Netanyahu has a 61 majority to form a government, he will be able also to unwind such a legislation. So it's more relevant as a blue and white and Lieberman threat to Mr. Netanyahu if we legislate it for the next Knesset, you better uh, reach a deal right now because there will be question marks about your future ability to form a government if you drag us to another election. Thank you. And I just want to mention to everybody again, we have a few more minutes. So if you do have a qu any more questions, please continue to write them in. Um, another one that came in is that I noticed that Haredi parties have stayed stagnant over the years. Isn't that surprising with their birth rate? Well, good question. Yeah, it's uh, the, as we've seen, uh, go, the, the Haredi parties we've seen in 09, they were 16, and then they went up to 18 in 2013. Uh, the, their figure in 09, the 16 figure, represents, if I remember correctly, 11 for Shas and 5 for the uh, Ashkenazi UTJ. Now, the Shas 11 of 09. Uh, uh, represented uh, uh, less than half of ultra-Orthodox Sephardi voters, and more than half, say around, it was perhaps about six uh, uh, seats of uh, traditional uh, Sephardi voters that identified with the Shas, with the, Shas the message, and with uh, 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 Ovadia Yosef as a spiritual leader, and so on. So that, that, that reflected the Shas, Traditionally, although what the leadership was ultra-Orthodox, the, the rank the voters weren't, uh, were a mix of uh, a traditional and ultra-Orthodox uh, Sephardi uh, men and women. In, in 2013, they, they went up to 18 seats as a result of the whole question of recruitment bill and the fact uh, that uh, there was an intention to recruit, uh, uh, to apply the recruitment law uh, equally. I was a part of it at the time, and, uh, and that pushed them out to, to vote uh, in, in greater numbers and, 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 and gave uh, momentum to their campaign. In 2015, the decline to 13 is a result of the, after the death of Rabbi Ovadia Yosef, 
the component of not orthodox Shas voters went down and it remained only the, 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 the ultra-orthodox without the traditional voters of Shas. What we're seeing now, and it's stabilized on 16 now, uh, so the 16 of 2020 versus the 16 of 12, 2009, reflects the demographic growth of the ultra-orthodox community. So UTJ is up from five to seven. And even the, sh the nine uh, seats of Shas probably reflect around seven voters of ultra-orthodox and about two seats of traditional. So generally, it's a, although it's pretty, supposed on, on the face of it, pretty stable, it does actually reflect a, a growing demography of the ultra-orthodox community. And some of the votes that went in the past to Shas this time move to the Likud. Thank you. And I think we have time for one more question. So let's end with this. Until a new government is hopefully formed, will there be any oversight over the executive branch? Well, the Knesset, the Knesset uh, uh, traditionally, uh, when it wasn't such an issue to form a government after an election, the Knesset would form um, some kind of an interim house committee just to perform immediate tasks and perhaps a finance committee, an interim finance and an interim defense and foreign affairs committee. Then a government would be formed and chairmanships of committees would have been uh, assigned and, and the Knesset would uh, uh, go up and running. What we're seeing now is that there are no standing committees since April of last year. And essentially the Knesset went on a, on a break even before. So for a year and a half, we have no oversight over the government, uh, over government ministries. Now the government is taking far-reaching decisions on uh, entering the cell phones of every Israeli, on uh, allocating uh, the emergency budgets to help uh, small and medium-sized businesses. I mean, the government is make, making massive decisions with no Knesset uh, input, no Knesset oversight in uh, um, and, 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 that is, and that is a problem. And since the crisis might continue, what I expect to happen is that uh, the Knesset committees will be, uh, uh, unlike in the past, would be erected and, and, and manned even as an interim measure in order to uh, uh, provide oversight, especially in, in, in a time of uh, a corona. But hopefully we will have a stable government that will be able to carry us through this crisis, prevent a ridiculous fourth election cycle, and uh, and uh, and uh, allow uh, and, and give Israelis some hope that uh, the political uh, leadership is is, uh, is is cares about them and about their uh, uh, needs and, and and their future, while everything that they knew about uh, our environment is is put in question. Very good. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate your partnership always with JFN and your partnership and IDI's partnership and bringing all this information. And this is not the first time that we had a webinar that you had to switch gears the night before pretty much and figure out how to make it so timely because things are always so dynamic and changing. So thank you so much, Yochanan, for your partnership and for all this information. I want to thank everybody for joining us and also mention to you that we have lots going on in the next few weeks. We have a webinar tomorrow on the coronavirus and the community response is going to be the first in, in a series. So please reach out to me or look at your email for more information about that. And next week on the days that we're going to be our conference in Florida on Monday and Tuesday, we're going to have lots of different things going on. So please look also, look, you can reach out to me or look out um, on our website and your, your emails to see um, all the different topics that we're gonna be discussing and join us for whatever you're able to, to join us for. And, and again, thank you, Yochanan, and thank you, everybody. Thank, thank, you, thank, you. thank you, stay healthy and safe out there, and, and I hope to see you all again soon.